Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for coming. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Richard Cooper. I am president and CEO of NY Spin. We take a few moments to thank our sponsors, CooperPresents.com, managing our website, managing and hosting other websites that may be of interest to you. Pearson Education, O'Reilly Media, and Auerbach Publications provide books and e-books that we raffle off at NY Spin events. We'd also like to thank the Internet Society of New York chapter for sponsoring the videos. Jeff Dalton is a certified Scampi leader, lead appraiser, Scrum master, CMMI instructor, and Scrum product owner. He's president of Broadsword, an author, consultant with over 25 years of technology and software process improvement experience, the author of the popular blog, Ask the CMMI Appraiser, where he answers questions on topics related to agile methods, CMMI, and Scampi. He's also co-author of the SEI publication, CMMI or Agile, Why Not Embrace Both? and is the creator of Agile CMMI, an iterative and incremental approach to process improvement based on the CMMI. Jeff's software engineering and process improvement career spans over two decades with companies including Electronic Data Systems, Ernst & Young, IntelliCorp, and Evo Edifice. Jeff flew in this, morning, this afternoon from Michigan and is an instrument rated pilot. No, he didn't fly us on a plane. Yeah, I didn't, no. An experimental airplane builder. He's also active on several corporate and nonprofit boards. Without further ado, Jeff. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. When I got in tonight, I was running a couple of minutes late. I was supposed to be here at 5, but it was about 5.15, but on my way over here. Um, well, I should tell you first that I actually grew up in New York, but I haven't been here since 1979. So at least I haven't been here for any length of time. And on my way over here, I saw two things that delayed me. One was one of those carts with the big pretzels on it. So I stopped and got one of those. And another one was a piece of authentic New York pizza that you can't get anywhere else in the world. I've tried it, but now I'm here. So that's why I was a couple minutes late. So I apologize for that. Um, so we'll talk about agile resiliency and how to make agile thrive and survive. <clears throat> Take a little drink first, and then I'll get into it. Agile is dead. The days of Jolt Cola, skateboards, nothing getting written down, just coding, those days are over. Actually, one time I started with this slide and the audience started applauding. <laughs> Yeah, um, this is what I want to talk about. Um, we don't want to see this happen, but this is what's happening. Agile, according to conventional wisdom, is exploding exponentially in our industry. But if you look at it closely, you realize it's only exploding horizontally. It's not exploding vertically. Jeff Sutherland, he's a wonderful author. I know Jeff, Ken Schwaber, Ron Jeffries is a neighbor of mine. None of them have a ticket to a boardroom. None of them speak at conferences outside of Agile software conferences. Write great books, they're brilliant men and women, uh, but Agile is not exploding vertically. It's exploding horizontally, which means it doesn't have corporate support in the boardroom. And that's a problem. Talk about why. Have you ever had a customer or a manager, or if you're an internal Agile shop, have they ever said anything to you like this? Let's be more agile, but how about if we only have a weekly standout? You've heard that? Right. How about this one? Let's transition all our projects over to agile by November. We should update the date. This one came from a major automotive company that you would recognize who actually called me in August and said this. Sure, go ahead and be agile. Just don't bother the customer. Right? Be agile. Be CMMI level three. Be ISO certified by Tuesday. I had a project that had the back before the CMMI, one of the CMM, that they had a, a, a 
12 day for being cinema. Right, yeah. Let's be 18 by Tuesday. Yes. Let's be mature by Tuesday. Yeah. Right. What the heck does all that mean? All these questions come from senior management. People running companies, but more importantly, people controlling our budgets. So anyway, you gave me a nice intro. Thank you very much. Um, I did grow up in New York, but I, um, I moved out to the Midwest partially because I was into building airplanes and we actually have you know, fields and things like that out there, which is really cool. Uh, but um, just let you know, that I'm, I'm going to give you some links to some data because you guys paid good money to be here tonight and I want you to leave with something valuable other than the nuggets I leave you with. But if you go to my blog, Ask the CMO my appraiser, there's probably about 700 um, questions and answers about Agile, about CMMI, about project management and process improvement. Lots and lots of really cool stuff and, and it's, it's a very uh, well read blog. We get five or 600 readers a day and we get lots of questions, so you're free to go out there anytime you want and look at that or ask any questions, a lot of data. Um, throughout the course of today's presentation, Richard's already given us, he spiked it for us, gave us the prototype. Speak up, raise your hand, talk. Um, this isn't a lecture, I don't like to lecture. Um, but let me give you some other resources to, uh, to download and take with you. Um, this particular paper is the most downloaded uh, work product on the SCI's website, even today, we wrote it three years ago. And it's called CMMI or Agile, Why Not Embrace Both? The co-authors on this were myself, Hillel Glazer, David Anderson, who you probably know, Mike Conrad and Sandy Shrum, who are the authors of the CMMI book. Um, but this is, uh, gets about 300 downloads a day from the SCI's website, so it's very popular. Richard? Uh, let me just mention that Jeff is going to send you the presentation and it'll be posted on our Yeah, website. it'll be posted on the website. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm also going to give you some, I'm going to give you some QR codes at the end to pull out your phone and, and go ahead and snap them and, and have it. Um, another paper you may want to download is, is the Cutter IT Journal, which is a fantastic, if you don't get Cutter, you should definitely read it. Um, they're out of Boston, and of course the Cutter Consortium is a big consulting organization of independent consultants. And um, last year they had an issue called Agile CMMI, why isn't this conversation dead yet? And I was one of the featured authors. You can also download this um, on our website, it's for free. It's a really, really interesting article. Um, I spent a lot of time writing it, so I'm pretty excited about it. So, let's get back to the problem at hand. Scrum is not a free-for-all where Agile teams do whatever they want, don't write anything down, don't follow any rules, and then just write code. That's not what it is. On the other hand, CMMI is not a death march that saps our powers and turns us all into zombies, forcing us to all do everything the same way. Both Scrum and CMMI have a marketing problem. It's not a, a feature problem, it's a marketing problem. Because they're both about the same thing. CMMI and Agile are both about solving business problems. Late requirements, misunderstood requirements, late projects over budget, defects in our software, too many meetings in the dark about projects. All of these things are problems that exist in every software project. There isn't a software project on the planet that doesn't suffer from every one of those problems. And I go to a lot of clients and do appraisals, and at the end of the three or four days of working with them, I say, well, <coughs> your projects are a little late sometimes, and your requirements aren't clear, and I go through the list, and they're like, oh, that's so brilliant. It's the same exact problem in every single software project. If you don't have those problems, you're either pay, you're not paying attention or you're telling a story. Because every software project has these problems. The question is, is how do we manage them? Both Agile and CMMI are there for solving problems. We have a marketing problem. If you think of Agile and CMMI as a set of levers, CMMI has 356 of them, actually. 356 little levers that we get to turn, push and pull, and set volume knobs at different levels in order to get different behaviors. If you think of it like that, then they're, just, they're both just about behaviors. Scrum and CMMI are just behavioral models. That's all they are. You can do any kind of work with Scrum and CMMI. As a matter of fact, I build airplanes using Scrum and CMMI. 
I have a backlog, I have a board, I have practices, I have all those things. Hopefully it'll make them a little safer when I test fly them. That's, that's the plan anyway. Unfortunately, Agile success has attracted a couple of small adopters. General Motors has the largest commercial IT budget on the planet, $4 billion. They spend $4 billion a year on IT. And that includes hardware, software, and infrastructure and things like that, but it's still a huge number. It's a couple of billion in software. The DOD spends more money than that. They spend close to $10 billion on IT a year. And the Veterans Administration is another massive budget, three or four billion dollars in IT. Oh, between the two of them, we're closing in on 16 or 17 billion dollars in IT spend every year. Those three organizations and a lot more like them have said that they're going agile. They're, gonna dire they're directing their IT organizations to transition over to more agile projects. You think that's going to have an impact on our business, on the agile business? It definitely will. Remember this guy? Danger Will Robinson. Go ahead. It already has, actually. It already has. And I'll talk about that for one second. Look around the room. Some of us are old enough to remember when Waterfall was cool. Remember? Remember when Waterfall was the hip thing? Waterfall was going to fix all the problems. It was going to stop chaos. It was going to stop all of this mind-numbing confusion and get everything in order. That was back in the 70s. Uh, no, yeah, nothing structured, really. The idea of, of structured development and structured coding really wasn't, wasn't in the, part of the industry then. You ever see the old um, Grace Hopper videos? Anybody watch those? Grace Hopper was, she was the, the, the mother of COBOL, I guess. I don't know exactly what her, she was a Navy Admiral. But she gives a lot of, she's, she's not with us anymore, but she gives a lot of wonderful uh, videos about what software industry was like prior to, like in the 50s. She tells a story about, you know, the, the first bug that was discovered, you know, that story with the moth. And, and so she's fantastic. But Waterfall was not created to be a heavy, burdensome, document-focused, mind-numbing, soul-killing process that we think of it as today in our Agile teams. It wasn't created to be that way. It was the cool thing. It actually has evolved in the last 30 or 40 years to meet the needs of these large-scale adopters. So when Lockheed Martin and IBM, and, and um, believe it or not, IBM existed before that, um, uh, General Motors, when they adopted this waterfall method, they started beefing it up because they already were doing business that way. They already had a ton of documents. They already had a ton of meetings. They already had phase gates for all of their engineering. So they just transferred all that to software development. They created this monster that we, many of us, um, are not embracing anymore today. Guess what? They're still like that. Anybody ever been to General Motors or Chrysler or Ford? Yeah. You're working on a big, massive project that's the biggest thing in your life. There's hundreds of developers, and you look at the org chart, and there's 93 boxes above you. It's these, these companies, you can't imagine how big they are when you're in their headquarters. It's unbelievable. And the DOD is, is 10 times the size. So they really have an impact on how we write software, and they completely created this idea of waterfall the way we understand it today. And the federal government is the number one um, let's call it a fender, I don't know if that's a good word, but they're the number one supporter of this type of development work. The problem is, is while, while, while we're all off iterating, the business is all off waterfalling. In other words, we're in our development teams, we're cruising along Sprint 93, you know, doing our backlog, having fun with backlog grooming and all this stuff, and the accountants up there are saying, I don't know what those kids are up to down there, but I don't like it. Right? And, they're start, and you're starting to see a lot of these companies having multiple layers of management. So you got five scrum teams and then I got two project managers. Project managers create a Microsoft project work plan, they create a risk log, they do all the documentation, they manage everything, they translate story points into hours. Bad idea, but they do it. And so now we have companies in Washington saying one story point is one day of work. 
Well, some of you are engineers. Think through that. Reverse engineer what that does to Agile. It completely destroys the concept of agility. Right? If we're gonna if we're gonna create story points in time and put them in the same box, we've destroyed the equilibrium of Agile completely, and that's exactly what's happening. Part of the problem with marketing is Agile teams also think process is a bad word. They don't want process, right? Agile teams say we don't use process. Wait a minute. Agile teams use a lot of process. As a matter of fact, Ken Schwaber says, and Ken's a great guy, he says Agile teams are more disciplined than waterfall teams if you do it right. Now, have you ever seen an Agile team be more disciplined than a waterfall team? Yeah, the good one. Good ones can be. But the problem with a lot of um, the Agile ceremonies is, is they're weak. They're not robust enough to exist in this new corporate environment, like in the DODs of the world, the big companies of the world. They're inconsistent. They're different from project to project, different from team to team. They produce different outputs and different results. Yes? What they all, the challenge they all face is that very often they're working on projects Whose schedule has been defined by someone That's right, yeah. to get yeah. a contract who, for some reason, had to say, we can do it in six months. Right, for this much. Right, exactly. Yeah, and that's, that's part of the values of the company, right? There's a mismatch between what the company's trying to accomplish and what the scrum teams are doing at the lowest level, right? How do you rationalize the difference between the way an agile team is supposed to work and your management is saying, I want an 18-month release plan. So you can't rationalize it. It's a tight mismatch. So, so what do you do? <laughs> well, you blow up the company. That would be a good place to start. <laughs> but, so that, that's a great question, and it's a much bigger question. right? It's an organizational change management problem. I give this other talk we were talking about earlier, the values-based engineering. I call it an organizational tight mismatch, where our organization has values that are waterfall-based, low trust, Phase gated, you know, fixed budget, and our scrum teams are, um, are transparent, collaborative, uh, high trust, and those two you have a tight mismatch in there. And the problem is, is it'll never write itself until somebody changes. And the reason I give this talk is be, the agile teams are going to change if we keep doing what we're doing. Now, there's a couple of different approaches we can take to address this. Uh, you're familiar with SAFE, the Scaled Agile Framework, and DAD. These are starting to get popular. By the way, the Agile community hates SAFE and they hate DAD. It's the management that loves SAFE because it makes it look like waterfall. Sorry, what's SAFE? Oh, Scaled Agile Framework. It's a sort of an up-and-coming uh, framework for addressing large-scale Agile projects. Um, and it's starting to get a little bit popular among senior management of companies. It's not very popular among Agile teams. Uh, Ken Schwaber just wrote an article about this I thought was fascinating, but the title of the art article was Safe, the Rupp Boys are back in town. <laughs> and I just thought it was really insightful because he's right. It's, it's somebody trying to make Agile like Waterfall in a lot of ways, and they're eliminating the flexibility and the agility of Agile teams. So there's a lot of problems with it. Um, so I'm not a big fan of SAFE, but I am a big fan of strengthening the Agile ceremony so they work, work really well and produce consistent results, because that's really what we're after. And the CMMI is a really cool tool for that, because there's practices, 350 plus in level two and three, that address every single one of these CMMI things, I'm sorry, these Agile ceremonies, and we can apply those to really make the Agile practices super strong and resilient so that a retrospective really makes us better as a company, so that our planning really is accurate, so our estimating really is accurate. And so uh, that's kind of what this talks about. Um, so I came up with this idea of agile resilience, and agile resilience is the ability to withstand all of this pressure that's coming, the $20 billion a year of pressure that is about to descend upon the agile industry. It's, it's a massive problem. Um, power or ability to return to the original form position after being bent, compressed, or stretched. The secret to saving agile isn't to change it so it looks like waterfall, which is where we're going. The secret to saving agile is make it strong and resilient and powerful so that it works everywhere and it's reliable and that people can deal with it. Um, and we can prove to the boardroom that it's actually an industrial strength. 
kind of process. Because we're not doing that, by the way. If anybody thinks you're senior management, unless you're in the smallest company, if you're working for a major company and you think your senior manager is on board with Agile, he's not. I promise you. I've been a CIO of three different companies. They don't know what Agile is. Mm -hmm. When they hear Agile, they think faster and cheaper. So if I say, I can give you software faster and cheaper, the CIO is going to say, I don't care how you do it. Agile, Schmagile, Kanban, Crystal, Waterfall, I don't care. Just give it to me faster and cheaper. That's really what they're thinking. Their perspective of Agile isn't what a great way to, what did Sutherland's book said, Jeff's book said, uh, how to do twice the work in half the time. No, they're not thinking about any of that, right? And, and that, even that title is a little... A little fuzzy, right? So, uh, I think Jeff is trying to sell to uh, these people who think that way. He is. He's using a little bit of their, that. Yeah. It's not, it's not really what it's doing. I think Jeff is trying to get into the boardroom. Yeah. And I think that's great that he's trying to do that. Um, it's an unfortunate thing that he hasn't been able to, or I'm not picking on Jeff, but just that whole movement hasn't really made its way into the corporation like it needs to. Um, companies need to adopt agile principles or not, right? So including how they run marketing, how they run advertising, how they run sales, how they run everything. In my company, uh, and we're a small company, we only have 10 people, but we run our company using Scrum. And we don't write software. We do everything with Scrum, including marketing and sales and operations and billing and the whole thing. So it's a, really something to think about is you want to run your company with these values because it's about values. It's not about Scrum or XP. It's about are we running a collaborative, an iterative, a transparent, a high trust. If we're going to do that, then the techniques trickle down, right? Yes? Yeah, I'm in a situation where we're trying to bring Agile to a broader audience, uh, except that our flagship uh, team uh, was get, uh, a year, year and a half ago was given basically a free hand to run Agile properly and to, to deliver a tool, mm -hmm. and it was a disaster. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's a lot of those. I'm trying to find a way to recover from that. Yeah. Uh, any pointers? Yeah, so, so I, that's, I'm really glad you said that because there's this like belief out there that if you run an Agile project that the rainbows will descend upon us and everything will work great. And there are hundreds and thousands of failed Agile projects that nobody's talking about. You know why? Because it's really hard to tell when an Agile project fails. Because if your principle is, is, well, if we run out of time, we're going to put it in the next sprint, you can push that along for a long time before somebody upstairs says, oh, wait a minute, this is going on for too long, right? So you know, starting small is a good thing, and, and, and piloting is a good thing, but it sounds like they didn't really have like an executive sponsor at a high enough level to really sponsor this thing and make sure that the stories were correct and that they were aligned with the business vision and the goal. So it's, it's almost like you have to, instead of piloting horizontally, like we're going to do this project down here, you need to pilot vertically. You need to have like a senior vice president or CIO, and you need to have line managers and all these people, a tiny sliver of your organization, right? All working together to make this work. And that includes policies and values and reward systems and metrics. You know, if you're going to say, I believe in Agile, now I'm going to measure CPI and SPI. It's like... Right? And this is what we see everywhere, is they want to see those traditional things, but they want teams to be agile. So that's that type mismatch thing I was talking about. So if you think about vertical, vertical spike instead of horizontal spike, that makes, makes it a lot more real. That's what I do. Okay, because, because they, to a large degree, they actually have that. It's just that when, they, when the tool went to the community, they said, what are you talking about? Who gave you your requirements? This is completely... Well, it sounds like they weren't really agile then. Right. Yeah, because um, one of the, and, and I'll talk a little bit about this. And I'm not, why don't you let me go ahead? Because I am going to, I am, no, that's all right. I am going to address that. I'm an architecture nut, by the way. Uh, software, everything, I'm really all about the architecture. And process has architecture also, right? And if you start thinking about process in terms of what does our process architecture look like, you get, this is a very simple drawing, but you get something that looks like this. You get values at a company. The highest level, the values of our company. If our values are uh, high trust, uh, transparency, collaboration, those types of agile, uh, agile values that you see in the Agile Manifesto, that traces and, and trickles down to the methods we use to do our work. So if I, in my company, 
uh, we have a set of values that are published. And our values are, you know, we trust our people and, and, you know, they're the most important thing. And we have a lot of very open, transparent kind of values. Everybody in the company has ownership stake. And, you know, we kind of are, are a, a collaborative team. Well, the team said, heck, if we're going to have those values, shouldn't we be using Scrum? Because Scrum fully supports those values. Before they said that, we were kind of running it in a waterfall way. We were, we were making plans every year and we were, you know, putting estimates together for all the things we did. And I said, yeah, look, that is interesting. Look, we got these fail fast. You know, one of our rules in our company is that it, we never care who caused it. Just, you know, let's fix it kind of an attitude. We have a, you know, everybody bails water kind of a mentality. Like, it, I don't care what your role is. And so the team is like, hey, why don't we use Scrum? Because Scrum has a direct connection to those values, right? It, Scrum was designed to support those values, right? And then from there, we're like, well, well, that means that Things like planning poker, which support this value and are part of this method, it all goes together and we have this really well-defined, well-tied-together architecture, right? What we see now is teams saying, oh, we have daily stand-ups, we're agile, but we only do them once a week. Or we play planning poker. We don't actually have cards, but we play planning poker. And how do you do that? Oh, we all, we all talk about what number we think it is. Well, guess what? Planning poker, if you're not familiar with it, is really cool because it eliminates the overbearing voice. That's the point. The planning poker, the game isn't the point. The point is, is that if, if uh, you know, Bill is really loud and Joanne isn't, it doesn't mean Bill has the right answer. But in a traditional estimating environment, Bill wins because he's like, I know this. I don't mean this picking on you. I should have reversed that. Sorry. If Joanne was overbearing. <laughs> Anyway, the cool thing about planning poker is it's like one, two, three, foom. Okay, let's talk about it. One, two, three, foom. And it eliminates that kind of bullying, that's what it is, that goes on. And that is directly tied to the value. So if we have values like this, but we're not using techniques like this, we have a tight mismatch between the values, the methods, and the techniques. And this is what I mean about the vertical slice. You've got to look at it vertically, not horizontally. Anybody can do this stuff. It doesn't give you value if you don't have this, though. Right? So this is the kind of architecture that, I'm, that, that we need to build. And it involves um, bringing management on board. So let's say management says, hey, and this is exactly what's happening with the big companies. Hey, I want you to be agile, but use waterfall. So the teams come up and say, oh, let's do stand-ups and retrospectives. <laughs> Keep banging into this, right? And so this value here doesn't get transferred into the other parts of the company because there's a barrier, right? So if we were using Scrum here, especially if we were using like a Scrum of Scrums type of arrangement and we were doing global retrospectives and things like that, then we get some value out of it. Or if the company says, let's do XP, but they decide they're going to do a big plan up front and do a Microsoft Project Work Plan. It happens all the time. So. Type mismatch, really important problem to fix. We don't want to do that. Here's another example. Let's say that um, we want to deal with risk. We want to have a risk management strategy. So this is where the whole CMMI thing sort of comes into play. Uh, people look at something like CMMI and say, oh, CMMI talks about this very rigorous risk management strategy, but we want to be agile. I guess we can't use that. Well, if you look at this, if our company has values that are agile values, and we're using methods that look like Scrum, the appropriate place to gather risks is in the daily standup. So you could just follow the thread down to the source of the data, right? As opposed to a lot of companies that say, oh, we need to have a weekly meeting where we talk about risk. And that turns into a weekly project status meeting and then the daily standups fall away, right? So if you're looking at uh, how you're gonna manage risk in your organization, it always starts with the values. If your values in your company are low trust types of values, this isn't going to work for you. Matter of fact, I know it doesn't work. So you got to get that type, that uh, get rid of that type mismatch. Same with estimation. If we're going to estimate, and we have agile values. We're going to estimate using some XP and Scrum techniques like planning poker. There's traceability between those three layers, right? But if we're in a low trust, uh, fixed price, government contract environment, planning poker is not going to work for you. I have dozens of clients that say they use planning poker in a federal government environment. 
It's not possible. Somebody above them is translating story points into hours. That's how they do it. Because um, planning poker is a relative sizing tool, so it compare, it's really about comparing size. It's not a fixed dollar amount or effort amount. So every team is going to have a different amount of points, and they're going to work off those estimates. Scrum Team A, could, uh, their velocity could be you know, 50 points a sprint. Scrum Team B could have 15 points per sprint. They're still getting about the same amount of work done because the number of points isn't relevant. It's how they size to one another. So it's not appropriate to use story points for estimation in a low trust fixed price environment because somewhere along the line, you want to get to dollars, right? So we see this all the time. So what's happening is, is these low trust environments are driving scrum teams to use Y Band Delphi or Kokomo or software lines of code estimation techniques, which completely destroys the agile approach to software development. So you're starting to see a lot of that. Here's another angle to consider here. When we look, a lot of our customers are talking about developing requirements and what it takes to develop requirements. You need an architecture in an agile context to develop requirements also. So this, this drawing is a complete agile uh, requirements architecture uh, that has a lot of little add-ins that are kind of sweeteners. So you're probably familiar with product backlog and you're probably familiar with epics and user stories and child stories and tasks. So this is kind of a basic um, uh, kind of thing. Now, in CMMI has all kinds of practices that strengthen this, especially around validation of requirements. So what, I use Agile language here. And instead of using CMMI language that I kind of have written on the side here, requirements management and so forth, I call it a definition of done. It comes right out of the Agile playbook. Definition of done is drawn directly from these practices. So we can validate our requirements in an agile environment by applying these CMMI practices and requirements management, requirements development, and framing them as a requirements definition of done. If you're familiar with definition of done, it normally is applied to the user story, to the result, the code usually. I think we need to apply definition of done to all layers of the requirements development architecture, starting with what our customer asks for, what the big picture epics are and what the user story child and task are. By the way, in your situation, uh, it sounds like your customer wasn't involved in that. We also have on this side all kinds of inputs. So what the customer wanted is represented and strengthened by the CMMI practices here. And the second level, what they call the customer requirements and the product requirements are strengthened, the, strengthening the epics here. And then the user stories are further down the chain in requirements development 2, 1, 2, 2, and 2, 3. And then our tasks support these practices. The other thing that is in this architecture is a definition of appropriate estimating techniques for the various levels. Planning poker is very appropriate for user stories, and it's also appropriate for epics. But a lot of times in federal government environments, we're looking for big picture estimating from an effort and cost perspective. So you're starting to see wideband Delphi being used in here and then more agile techniques being used below. And so the problem on a fixed price contract obviously is you've got a disconnect between those two things that we need to address. But if we can strengthen how user stories, epics, and backlogs are created and managed by using the CMMI practice, we can make this architecture a lot more resilient. And this is just an example. You need to do this in every area, risk management, estimation, um, coding, code reviews, all those types of things. So the, the cool thing is that the CMMI gives us 18 uh, libraries, if you will, filled with checklist practices and ideas of how we can uh, strengthen every one of these things. So what I just showed you, this chart right here, is really just one thing, well, two things in here, this one, and this one, both of them having to do with requirements, you're going to have the same amount of definition for your Agile ceremonies across all 18 of these areas. Uh, sometimes people ask me, why am I leaving level two and you know, three and four out? And I'm not really leaving it out as much to say that these are functional practices and these are more infrastructure type things like how are we measuring, how are we tracking, how are we improving? How are we analyzing the way these things are working? So I'm mostly just focusing on these for this exercise. 
So, how many people are familiar with CMMI? Got some familiarity? Okay, got some. So those of you that aren't, CMMI is a, is a process model or a behavioral model that has, think of it as a massive checklist of what great companies do. So here's 356 things that great companies do. And the way they made that list up is Carnegie Mellon interviewed 100 or so different companies over the last 30 years and they evolved this model, started with the software CMM and they, um, they created this list. And then a lot of government agencies started saying, hey, if you want to work with us, you need to adhere to this list. And they call those maturity levels. That's the big, big picture anyway. So anyway, the CMMI um, is kind of the big elephant in the room when it comes to software development and processes. And the federal government has um, required a lot of companies to adhere to this model. You've probably heard the expression CMMI level, maturity levels, maturity level two, three, four, and five. And so it's become this thing that you have to achieve. But I've decided that it's much bigger than that. It's a great input into making our agile projects even better. So part of using it that way and not worrying about passing appraisals is to think of it a little bit differently than the marketing would make us uh, believe it is about. So I'm gonna ask you to turn it on its head a little bit and I'm gonna uh, tell you a couple of secrets about CMMI. Uh, has anybody been through a, an appraisal, a CMMI appraisal, a few people? Good, oh, good. So you, a couple of you know about it. So um, one of the things I do for a living is I conduct appraisals, I'm a lead appraiser. And um, we have a lot of secrets things that we're not supposed to tell you about how to pass appraisals. Um, but I'm gonna tell you some of them if you guys promise not to tell anybody else. So this is just between us, uh, the 12 of us, the video camera and everybody's Twitter feed. So we're just gonna keep it between us. Uh, but I do wanna share some secrets because I'm on a bit of a mission to change the perception and the marketing about CMMI. Um, by the way, when they created the CMMI thing, nobody ever expected it to turn into like a certification type of event. It was really meant for improvement. So let me teach you a couple of secrets about CMMI. Don't follow it, all right? Don't follow it. Don't do what it says. What do you mean don't do what it says? I'm gonna explain that, Bill. Just give me a minute. Don't be compliant with it. Don't be compliant with it. Two hugest problems in the CMMI community is people think they have to follow it and be compliant with it. It's not a compliance model. It's not ISO. But do, do ask the CMMI questions. And what do I mean by the CMMI questions? How do we do it? Why do we do it? Who's supposed to do it? When are we going to do it? For every single thing that you do on your Agile team, you should be able to answer these questions. Who's supposed to make sure the customers know what the system's supposed to do? Who's supposed to know that? Yeah, but does that work? Didn't work for you. So obviously that answer is wrong, right? Right, and they didn't ask the question, probably. They read Ken Schwaber's book and they just went off and did it, right? The CMMI, is much more effective as a tool to make Agile resilient if we turn it into a set of questions. How do we do this? So there's a CMMI practice that says, um, estimate the scope of the project. So I say, okay, we could do that. We could pick some estimating method and do it just because the model says we have to. Or we could sit down as an Agile team and say, how are we gonna estimate the size? How are we gonna do this? And collaborate on a solution to make it happen, right? Every single Agile ceremony can be strengthened by ask, going through the CMMI and asking these questions. The cool thing about the CMMI is it lays it all out for us. What's our, what's our, what expectations are we gonna set? Who's involved with it? When are they involved? What are the tools we're gonna to use? How are we gonna train them? Where are we gonna put all this stuff? What stakeholders are involved? They didn't ask that one with you. Right? How are we going to know if the process is working? How are we going to know if people are actually doing what we want them to do? And how does management know that it's even working? Anybody familiar enough with the CMMI to know what I just said, what I just enumerated? The so-called, well that's partially, anybody else? The 10 generic practices in maturity level two. These are the 10 characteristics of a good process. 
Right? I, just, I just listed them off for you. I didn't use CMMI language when I did it because the CMMI language is establish an organizational policy. So what do people do? They go off and create a book with 18 pages in it on a policy on each and they make everybody sign it and then it goes on a shelf that nobody looks at. As opposed to asking the CMMI question, what am I supposed to do? What do you want me to do? Right? The second one is plan the process. It sounds very intense. It sounds just like that when you read it like that, right? What I want, what I, my CMMI question is, what's the plan here, guys? What are we doing? Provide appropriate resources. What does that mean? Oh, shoot, I don't have planning poker cards. I need those. What else do we, what else do we need? That's all these practices mean. That's all they mean is, what do we need? What are we doing? When are we doing it? Why are we doing it? And the biggest problem I see with Agile projects is those questions are unanswered. And everybody thinks they know how to do it and everybody's thinking something different. The values are the highest level of the architecture and the CMMI has some awesome practices. Things like, are we training people enough? Are people have the knowledge we need to do the job? Are we treating them well? Are we giving them what they need? Does everybody know what they're supposed to do and do they even understand it? And you know, what's the plan for ensuring people understand them and what's expected of me? And all these questions and there's associated practices in that sort of intimidating sounding language that answer all those questions for us. Right? How are we gonna get this rolled out? Right? We can strengthen things like Scrum and XP by asking similar questions which have corresponding practices in the book. Right? What methods are we supporting and why? Pure Scrum, by the way, doesn't work anywhere. Nowhere. There is not a single Agile implementation I've ever seen, and I've seen hundreds, that doesn't have mixtures of Kanban and Agile and a little bit of Waterfall. They don't want to say it. I think Richard, you and I were talking about this. Like somewhere in there, they're doing something that's, you know, they're doing some reporting, gathering some measure, doing something that's associated much more with the Waterfall organization. And that's okay, right? So which methods are we supporting and why? Which projects use which methods? We see that a lot, different projects doing different things. Maintenance projects doing a lot of stuff with Kanban, development projects doing a lot of with Scrum, overseas projects, uh, offshore projects, really hard to use Scrum. Waterfall makes a lot more sense in some cases. For a lot of, it sounds like you're gonna hear about that next month. Um, here's another one you hear people, how long are our sprints? You talk to five Agile teams, they have five different sprint lengths. It doesn't make any sense. How many of your sprints are in a release? They don't even plan it out a lot of times. And how do we really measure velocity, especially in a government environment where we're doing something different? A lot of teams measure velocity, but they're being, they're being measured in effort and cost. So why measure velocity? Here's another one. Any of you have scrum teams where people move in and out of the teams a lot and work on multiple scrum teams? Velocity is useless. Might as well not capture it. Velocity is only useful with a fixed team and a fixed time box. Okay, but everybody does it. They're all capturing velocity but it doesn't give you any value. So don't worry about it. In a true Agile team, don't measure CPI and SPI. It doesn't give you any value, uh, on time, on budget kind of stuff. It doesn't give you any value at all if you're running a true Agile project. Finally, at the techniques level, so remember we had values, they have to be Agile values. We had methods, they have to match and map to those values. And then we have techniques that map to both of those things. So the CMMI questions, you, you're probably noticing already, these questions are about infrastructure, like how are we gonna do this? What's the plan for rolling all this stuff out? What techniques do we support with what tools? Which projects use which techniques and why? You've heard of tailoring probably. Tailoring is not the act of tailoring out something. Tailoring's last name is an out, right? It's which projects are gonna use which of these techniques and why? These projects, this project uses Fibonacci, team estimating game, this project uses planning poker. Why do they do that, right? Which design and coding techniques are we gonna use and where the heck are the planning poker decks, mm -hmm. right? So there's a whole list of really cool practices in the CMMI to make these agile techniques, methods, and values stronger, more resilient, more consistent from project to project. 
And so when we move someone from one team to another, we know exactly, they know exactly what to do. So in a typical Agile organization, that infrastructure doesn't exist. Training uh, is, you know, go read Ken Schwaber's book. Uh, there's no consistency, or consistency about what happens outside of the scrum ceremony. Like what happens at a daily stand-up, right? What do we talk about? Well, we talk about what we did yesterday, what I'm doing today, and what I'm doing tomorrow, yada, yada, yada. Except we don't talk about risk, we don't talk about issues, we don't talk about lessons learned, we don't talk about a lot of stuff that's really important. Well, the CMMI's got lots of practices that say, your meeting should cover this kind of stuff, right? So take a look at that, and next time you have a daily stand-up, pull out the book and say, well, it says here we should be talking about if we have any risks. Well, that's a good idea, All right? We should do that. So we can kind of change the way Agile ceremonies work without adopting a safe or a RUP or a DAD or something that turns Agile into a waterfall. We can just make Agile ceremonies industrial strength and powerful and still maintain our, ad, our Agileness, our agility, by tying these three things together always and then taking each one of those and making them industrial strength using something like the CMMI. By the way, I'm a CMMI appraiser, so I use that as my model, but ITIL is just as effective for something like this. Um, ISO uh, 20,000 is just effect as effective for something like this. COBIT, a uh, little before my time, but just as effective for something like this. So it isn't just CMMI. So what I want to do now is give you a couple of things to just take back with you. A couple of things. If you do one of these things, you'll, I'm going to give you nine actually, but if you, maybe seven, I'll tell you when we get there. I changed it recently. I give you a number of tips to take back with you. And some of this stuff is, is complicated and more complicated than you think it is uh, to make happen. And you know, getting change to happen in your organization is really tough, especially if you have an embedded, entrenched culture. Uh, if you're a young startup company, it's a heck of a lot easier. But I'm gonna give you a few things to take back. If you just do one of them, you're gonna get a ton of value and it's gonna be well worth your time tonight. So let me, let me share a few with you. So, oh, good, seven. <laughs> Uh, the CMMI gives us these tools. Um, they're called the generic practices, and I'm only going to talk about seven of them. There's actually 12 in the book. Uh, they're all good. But the key to strengthening, strengthening the Agile architecture and being in a good Agile cis, uh, citizen is in these practices. So across the top, I have the CMMI version, the very sort of waterfallish sounding words, establish an organizational policy. So the Agile question I would ask here, and you should go back and ask people, are we setting clear expectations across the enterprise which Agile values, methods, and techniques we've deployed and adopted? Go back to your office, make sure everybody is completely on the same page of exactly which Agile values, methods, and techniques this company supports and why. Answer that question and you'll get an instant performance bump from your Scrum teams. Processes aren't things that exist on paper that are overhead. Processes are behaviors. There's another word, you know what the, another word for process is? Work. If someone gives you a process that adds to your workload but doesn't provide you value, they're not process wizards, they're wrong. Right? And I'm not saying it's easy, it's really hard. But all process is, is work. And the, you should strive to make your process embedded in your work and your work embedded in your process and it's all one thing. It's how we behave at work. You know, if I write a piece of code, I should have a code review because that's what engineers do. And if we're agile and we don't do code reviews, there's something very wrong with you, right? It's really important if you want code quality to do code reviews and it's not overhead. Now, if I say, now you got to write a 17-page report and you got to post it in two different places and you got to give your manager two different versions of it, now that doesn't make sense, right? So it's really a question of making sure people understand what we're supporting. Provide people with the right stuff. So if you go back to your office and you say, what are the right tools and facilities to successfully deploy agile values, methods, and tools? So I have a client, one of our clients is the Hong Kong Rail, Railway. So in, in Hong Kong, the railroad is owned by the government there. Um, 
as of this week, I think it's owned by the Chinese government, but that's a whole different story. Um, but they want, they want to adopt Agile, and we're working with them on a big Agile transformation project. Well, they don't want to collate their te co-locate their teams. As a matter of fact, their Agile teams inside of the team are split across three different locations around the city. Anybody been to Hong Kong? Not easy to get around, right? They also don't want to invest in software like uh, Jira or anything like that in order to help ease that. So they're, they've got a tight mismatch in their value, right? They say they have agile values, but they're not providing people with the tools they need to do it. So the first thing we said to them was, you need to fix this problem when we ask them this question. And you need to co-locate your teams if you're not going to buy them the technology. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, yeah. Sure, it is. It's not easy. Um, I have a client in D.C. Um, they're actually probably the leading agile company in D.C. They have about five, eh, about six hundred people in the company now. Um, they have people located all over the city, and they're not co-located. And what they've done is they have um, they went out and bought these rolling stands like you see in hospitals. You know that they put IVs on, and they mounted iPads on them. And they have um, team rooms where they have some people, and then they have three or four of these rolling stands, and they roll the stands in, and then the team's, the guy's face is right there, sitting at his computer, and they have stand-ups together, and yes, they make everybody stand up, even the guys working at home in their pajamas, and um, they, uh, when they have meetings, they roll the iPads in, and they always do the video, always. They never do it by telephone. So if you, I would say if you're going to try to use a telephone and you're not going to have people participate in the ceremonies, then you won't be successful. But you have to go out of your way. There's lots of tools out there. Sure. Cisco Jabber. Cisco's Cisco Jabber good. Jabber. Yeah, a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. TFS has a virtual whiteboard. TFS has a really nice virtual scrum board, too. And, and Jira's got a whole tool set that is really nice Jira as well. Greenhouse. Yeah, exactly. So there's, there's a lot of tools, but you got to have the hands-on piece. Uh, Schraber used to say that um, you know, a scrum team is like a developer with five separate heads on the same body so that they could all communicate instantly. And it's impossible to do that if people aren't there. So if they're not going to be in the same physical location with you, that facial you know, recognition, looking at each other, really makes a huge difference. So I would definitely look at, this stuff is free. Skype is free, so there's no reason not to do it. Yeah, yeah. There's always one or two outliers, mm -hmm. the person that works in the home, which is not going to be a video conferencing room. And I find right. the, the, most, the way to equal the playing field is to have everybody on a phone call, because that way you yeah. represent represented equally, whereas if you're in a room, the person yeah. can just walk by. Um, I lose too much on the phone. But, yeah. but the solution may be to force the people working at home to turn on the video camera. Yeah. yeah. That's, so I think, it, so remember I said earlier that... Google Hangouts is a great too. Yeah. I said earlier that Schreiber always says that Agile is more disciplined than, than Waterfall. This is a great example of that. These guys I work with in DC, they always have the video on, always. They never have a meeting without the person's face on the iPad, and they have four or five iPads on stands in any given meeting. So it's always open like that, and I think that's really important. So anyway, uh, another one that we see a lot of weakness in the Agile community is training. So does everybody really know about these values, what they really mean, what methods we're using, what techniques we're using? Almost nobody gets trained on Agile teams. You're expected to somehow miraculously know how planning poker works, how Fibonacci sequencing works, how um, sprint planning works, and you have all this kind of balkanization of Agile values, methods, and techniques because of that. And there's people doing all kinds of crazy stuff. So you really lose the value of it when you don't train people. The, the, the productivity level between a trained and an untrained scrum team is massive. It's really high. So it's definitely worth doing. So go back and say, does everybody get this? And if they don't, what are we going to do about it? Right? Here's a really hard one. How well is our team performing? Do we even know? Right? Figure it out. That's what Agile is supposed to solve. Ah, yeah. If, if, if. Your company has Agile values, you're using Agile methods, and you're using Agile techniques, then this is solved. You can figure this out. 
But the minute you have that tight mismatch between those three things, you can't do this. So you're starting to see how that, how that traceability is important now. You gotta have it. And if you're, if you're top of your organization is looking for effort and cost data and your scrum team's doing story points, you're never gonna get into the boardroom ever. It's not gonna happen. You're gonna be an anomaly. And that's really how they think of it. Um, Why can't you use the effort on the tasks? Effort on the tasks. Do you mean the tasks that support the stories? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're measuring effort hours. Are they? They roll up with TFS. They are. Yeah, TFS does try to fix that problem for you. Yeah. That would give you some data if you were to use TFS, I suppose. Yeah. You could track actuals, but you don't have the estimate to match it to. Right? Well, so what good is it? It, it, it asks you for effort hours. Yeah. In, in, in the estimates. Yeah, so somehow you have to figure out a... You have to translate from the story points yeah, to the effort hours. That's where it falls apart. Yeah. It's, it's hard to do. Yeah, yeah I, would, I would argue it's impossible to do, but it's definitely hard to do. I'll agree with that. Yeah. Um, couple, another thing here, is, this is starting to get really popular now. Are people living up to agile values and are they using the techniques and the methods? Right? Nobody's doing agile reviews, like our compliance reviews of agile projects. And this is really important. Uh, it's important in every single type of engineering, but for some reason on Agile teams, we decided we don't need to do this, right? We have to do it, right? So how do we know people are even living up to Agile values, techniques, and methods? Well, that raises a different question because I'm sure in every single company, Agile is different. That's exactly right, right? That's kind of what I'm getting at. It's very different in every company, very balkanized. So we need to, uh, we need to build a model Right, that everybody can align to. We need, and you know, the Agile community hates it when I say this, but I say it at all their conferences, and so far they haven't hit me with any tomatoes. Uh, we need an Agile maturity model that's actually real. And there's been some attempts made to create such a thing, but uh, it really hasn't been. I'm not saying safe or dad or turn it into something else. I'm saying, are they really being Agile? Right, yeah. Yeah. They are being agile. And it was really difficult for me. Yeah. There are some checklists uh, on, on the internet, but uh, I feel that they used my uh, evaluation report to um, assess the performance on the team yeah. and give reward or not. And it was not a, an improvement tool. Um, so All I right. tried to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's two problems with it. So the one problem is that it, there's no consistency, right, which is what you're talking about. The other problem is, is the method that you use to assess them. So one place to look for that is the CMMI has an accompanying appraisal methodology called SCAMPI, the standard CMMI appraisal method. Um, we've actually invented our own version of it. We call Scrumpy, which is a uh, scrum process improvement. But we basically draw on the same technique. And the really neat thing about Scampi is it's focused on process improvement and not on team performance. And it just takes a very objective view um, of, of the, uh, the process that they're using, not the performance of the individuals. So take a look at that. You can actually download that off our site too. It's called Scampi. And there's a lot of, lot of stuff in there, but basically there's a- We have a video of a past session which was about how to Oh, okay, great. Oh, excellent, good, okay. So let me just give you uh, one more, uh, I'm just about done. Um, and this is one, this is, this is kind of like an agile killer on this one. Does management care about how we work? Tell them, let them know how you work. It always shocked me when I became a CIO of a company that none of my counterparts cared at all about how people worked like what their behavior was, like how they went about their job. And to me, if you look, I mean, look at the great companies, Apple, Google, how they work is everything. It's the Apple way, right? And, and the Google way, and some of these, GE is like that. And it, all the companies you really admire have a way of working, have a culture, and have techniques and tools that they use to make themselves successful. 
Yet in most companies, management doesn't care at all how you do your work. They just care how hard you work, right? So you ever heard the expression, um, we need to do more with less? Have you heard it? You ever heard the expression, um, uh, we need to get better? Does anybody know what that means? Nobody knows what that means, except for I bet you Apple and Google know what that means. As a Jets fan, I know what <laughs> Well, as a, as a Lions fan, I know they don't know what we need to get better means. Um, but yeah, it, part of this is, man, is, is in, it's incumbent upon management to take responsibility for caring. Right? They gotta get their heads out of their spreadsheets, <laughs> stop thinking about their next merger and acquisition, and start thinking about how work gets done. And that starts with values sometimes called company goals and objectives. That's right? another word for that. So are they getting the results we'd hoped for? Why, why not, right? So that, that's a, you know, fig, getting that one figured out is really, really important. And here's the last one. How will the project down the hall benefit from the lessons we learned? So the CMMI says, collect process related experiences. That's all good, whatever that means. And we know in Agile teams, we do retrospectives, right? At least you do retrospectives, right? About half of the Agile teams don't do them, but I'm glad you all nodded yes. Um, how about helping the team down the hall? You sharing all your lessons with them? Probably not, because it's not, it's not in Schwaber's book, right? So you don't do it, Richard. Yeah, well, we had the same thing in the waterfall days. Where we yes, go, oh yeah. Yeah. Back, back in that time before the internet stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. They put it in a yes, there used to be this time when we didn't have an internet. Let me tell you about it. And we had phones that, anyway, never mind. And you put it in a binder, and the binder went on a shelf, and it all collected dust, and nobody ever looked at it. But let me tell you why this is more insidious. Let me tell you why this is more insidious. Agile teams believe they do this, because they do retrospectives. But besides the fact that half of Agile teams don't do retrospectives, they never share. So they're all running around saying, we're really good at this. We get better and better. But the team down the hall is still making the same mistakes they just figured out. But, but they can't because it's not scheduled into the sprint. Well, no, no, you're right. It, would, it, wouldn't happen, it wouldn't happen in real time. But there's no reason you couldn't build an architecture around capturing lessons and capturing retrospective data that other people could mine and share, right? The, part of the problem is, is that Scrum doesn't have, or Agile in general, doesn't have any kind of notion of infrastructure, like a lessons learned repository or a measurement database or anything like that. There's no notion of, hey, we're just more than four people, right? You know, the, the, uh, the whole idea that Scrum is really good for four or five people, but not for 500 people, it could really be good for 500 people with all of this. You know, the great irony is, you know where XP was created? Everybody thinks it was created in like some little startup. Does anybody know this story? A payroll maintenance system at Chrysler. Four guys, Ron Jeffries and uh, a couple of other guys started out. So they, it, w it wasn't like some tiny little thing, startup, where they were just like messing around. It was a big corporate, you know, big iron type of mainframe project actually at the time. So um, yeah, really interesting that history. Um, so I put together my own manifesto. So the cool thing about the Agile manifesto is I, I looked at the Agile manifesto and I said, these guys, you know, they climbed up in a mountain, they sat in a smoke teepee for a couple of days, they smoked a peace pipe, and a bunch of smoke came out of the top of the teepee as well as a million conferences, books, and millions of dollars for them. So I thought that was a really cool idea. So I'm gonna come up with my own manifesto. Uh, so I came up, and so far I haven't made millions or written a lot of books about this, but maybe someday. Um, I call it the Agile Process Manifesto. So as we go through the process of improving our Agile teams, innovation always outweighs mandates, process mandates. Um, just like the Agile Manifesto, by the way, uh, the stuff on the right's important, it's just not as important as this. Uh, I'm not saying don't do that. Process mandates are important. We have audits, we have clients, we have customers that demand things, that's okay. Useful processes, things that help us that don't add overhead, outweigh any kind of certification or audit our manager wants us to get. ISO, CMMI, ITIL, whatever. Collaboration always outweighs coercion and punishment, right? Work together to answer the CMMI questions. Don't sit in a silo and write a book and then force everybody to follow it, right? Flexibility and agility in the process outweighs rigid <laughs> compliance. 
So when we're going back and trying to make Agile more resilient and make it better for our, our users, we want to focus on innovation, usefulness, collaboration, and flexibility, but also keep in mind that mandates are sometimes important. Certifications and, and just being strong and, and rigid sometimes is important. Sometimes you got to be harsh on people who are, who are resisting. That does happen. And compliance is, is important in some cases, too. So this is my, my version of the Agile Manifesto. So, oh. That's Scott Ambler, who talks about digital. So let me just finish, because I know I'm out of time. Um, don't change Agile. Don't try to turn Agile into waterfall. Don't listen to the safe guys, the rough guys, or the bad guys. Ah, they're, they're fine. I have nothing against them. I just don't uh, totally buy into what they're doing. Uh, make Agile more resilient. Make what you're already doing better by adopting a proven model like a CMMI to make your organization even better. Right? Why not? So, if you want to click this, it'll take you right to the repository of questions, and I think if it doesn't work, I'll let you know. We just had our website up done, so I have to change it. But I'll take any questions that you guys have right now. Yeah. Yes, I found that's a very interesting discussion. You mentioned the one point, and correct me if I'm wrong, that there are hundreds of thousands of players, public players using Agile. There's been a lot of examples, yeah. But in general, the, the success rate is very low for projects in the industry. The failure rate is traditionally 60 to 70. 70 percent, right. Independent of the process or approach. Right. So, so my question is, are there any independent metrics, and I know it's a difficult challenge, to compare um, agile developed projects with the traditional one? Yeah. I mean, that's needed in the industry. It is, it? yeah. Just an organization like Gartner or the Cutter Group or yeah, I'm not, I'm not familiar with Gartner or Forrester doing one. There is, a, there is an individual in DC who's assembled a bunch of data, and now I'm trying to remember his, his name, and he's written quite a few articles about it. But I find the data a little, I'm a little skeptical about the data in general. Uh, one of the reasons is, is that um, a true agile project will tell you, well, we're never late because we just have another sprint, um, which a lot of projects that are in that 70% number you talked about are in that number because they're over budget and late. A scrum project is never late or over budget, theoretically. Well, right? It's going to depend how you define failure. Right, exactly. Or categories. Does the, 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 the budget, the timeline, meeting the original requirements? That's right. Quotes, yeah. And the quality indicator. So I don't think anybody's figured that part of it out. It's like comparing apples to oranges somewhat. Yeah, it really is. So I'm not, I'm not aware of any reliable data. Yeah. What else? Any other questions? What do you guys think of this? Does it make sense? Does it make sense? You're going to go back and you're going to go make Agile awesome now? Are you inspired and motivated? Well, I think it's I think it's two things. I think one of them is that agile is ill-defined. In other words, it's there's not a lot of clarity around all the ceremonies and exactly what they're supposed to do. They're very high level. So the best book about Scrum I've ever read is by Chris Sims, and it's about 30 pages long. What's it called? It's called The Elements of Scrum. It's a fantastic book, but it basically says. Yeah, um, you get status by having a daily stand-up, talking about what you did yesterday, today, and what's blocking you. That's the whole chapter. It's like, well, hold on a second. And I love, Chris is a great guy, and I love his book, but it's just kind of like it's ill-defined or incompletely defined. So it leaves room for people to twist it and turn it, right? That was by design, by the way. They did it that way on purpose, right? But now that you've got the General Motors of the world saying, Okay, this project's going to be 97 scrum teams together. It's like, okay, hold on. We need something a little more structured here to make this real. Because what happens is right away it's like, right? So I think that's what's happening with it. Yeah. How would this work in a non scrum environment, CMI or uh, I mean, CMI without scrum, just uh, in an existing order? Right. So I didn't even get into that, but this kind of approach works with any pro any kind of approach to software. So waterfall, RUP, 
any of those kind of alternatives, V model in the engineering world, this type of approach works in all of those. I'm just focusing on Agile for this presentation. Mark's going to walk around collecting cards for the drawing more easy to let's go. Yes. Oh, good. Any other questions? Well, you he's your card, I'll take your uh, name badge. Yes. Uh, can I just have a challenge? Uh, we, are, we are not as an organization, so we are, we're still in line with the reading groups. We basically follow the waterfall. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Every now and then you get some of these new managers that you've got to be agile. But for the same reason that you said before, they, they want to get the work done faster. Right, yeah. Um, they get something they faster, but maybe not the whole thing. Yeah. And then nothing happens. Um, and I, I'm wondering how much of a, a roadblock for us is it that, that we have a, a yearly budget planning process where in September, October every year, the projects are already defined in broad blocks with yeah. With, with dollar amount and, and they have to right. in that. Is there any way that we can have that and still Sure. Agile? Every yeah. Agile company has annual budgeting sessions, yeah. but the, the units are different. So if I'm going to budget uh, you know, $100,000 for a project, that means I can, well, that's a small number. If I budget a million dollars for a project, that means I can have 10 <laughs> scrum team members, two separate scrum teams for a year because that's what 100, this $100,000 a year. I can have 10 scrum team members, two scrum teams, and I can calculate the story points if I work through all the requirements. <laughs> then I can get visibility into, can I run two scrum teams per year and can I get this many points done? So that's how I would do it. But, but if, if your budgeting process is a bit more disciplined than that, not just how, how much effort you need, but what are you gonna give me? Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, what kind of functionality am I gonna get? How do you rationalize that? Right. Right really hard to do mm -hmm. unless your management buys into, buys into all Agile. All they want to know is what they're going to get. That's all they care about. Right? Yeah. And that's the problem, right? Uh, well, I mean, that, that's the big rub. The, the, the best working <clears throat> Agile teams get the worst rewards and the worst bonuses. The, the, best? the Agile teams that do the best are the ones that deliver the functionality on time, on budget, and maybe corrupt the Agile processes. In maybe so. Way. Yeah, maybe so. Yeah, there's just a great article in, um, I want to say ASQ, Software Division Magazine, that talked about the most successful projects now are Agile Waterfall hybrids, and that's what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah I, I would agree. I think that is true. Yeah. Anyway, Richard. Well, thank you very much. Hey, my pleasure. Yeah.